Kunihiku Ikuhana. What a man. What a director! Known for creating and directing strange, bizarre, and yet immensely creative anime. These anime include Revolutionary Girl Utena and its movie counterpart, Adolescence of Utena, Penguin Drum, and Yurikuma Arashi. While not known by mainstream anime watchers, those who do watch these shows can admire Ikuhata's style of directing and how he crafts a story. He implements certain themes and symbolism into his works that are sometimes impossible to decipher but are so fun to discuss with others. Igohara is a type of writer and director who will create anything that he feels like and can get away with. And whether the things that he creates are good or bad, you know that he is going to shoot it in a visually spectacular way. The other thing that Ikuhara was known for is always implementing lesbian characters in his anime. In one way or another, his shows have some gay themes and characters in them, and as a cis straight male, he writes some pretty good lesbian stories. Two of his three main anime are actually some of my favorites, and I always find time to rewatch them again and again. Now you're probably wondering, what's the purpose of this video and why is it in Pride Month? Well, today, I want to analyze each of Ikuhara's three main anime and see what makes it what it is. I'll look at and discuss each show's theme, symbolism, and style. Now each person has a different interpretation of his anime, so it'll just be how I feel about them and some small research that I've done. I'll also look at the gayness level in each of his shows and how well it is handled. So let's get this started on this video already. The analysis of Kunihiku Ikuhara's works. So first we must ask, who the hell is this guy? Who is Kunihiku Ikuhara and how did he get his start in anime? Well, Ikuhara was born on December 21st, 1962 in Osaka. He studied graphic design at college and joined toy animation after graduating. Serving as an assistant director for a multitude of their anime, most notably being the main episode director for the second, third, and fourth season of Sailor Moon, including the Sailor Moon R movie. Later on though, displeased over the lack of creative control that he could be given at Toya Animation, Ikohara left the company after the fourth season of Sailor Moon in 1996. He then formed his own group, B. Pappas. The group went on to create both the anime and manga series Revolutionary Girl Utena. After the success of the show, the group created the Adolescence of Utena movie in 1999. Ikuhara would serve in minor roles in the creation of anime, like being the storyboard creator for the opening theme of Sweet Blue Flowers, but then in July 2011, he returned as a series director for Penguin Drum, and then finally in 2015, he served as series director for his latest project, Yurikuma Arashi. Ikuhara tends to have great interactions with fans, often attending many conventions and events coming dressed in brightly colored clothes when socializing with fans. He has also cosplayed as Sailor Mars on several occasions. Ikuhara also likes to tease his fans. When asked about the symbolism and themes of some of his works, he will often give a humorous, odd, or even evasive response to the question. The implication of this being that he wants to leave the interpretation of his works open to the audience. Ikuhara has stated that he likes anime with Yuri elements and always implements them in his works because he feels that when a female character is given a male love interest, the relationship between them tends to overwhelm the other elements of the show. He stated in an interview one time that he tried to kill Tuxedo Mask off in Sailor Moon multiple times, but obviously he wasn't allowed to fully do that. He often finds that the relationship that the male-female protagonist has with a male character can get in the way of the character's growth and character arc. So when he implements a lesbian couple in his show, he makes it a part of the overall story and a crucial part to these characters' journey. Now let's start talking about his three main anime, Revolutionary Girl Utena and its movie companion, Adolescence of Utena. The anime originally came out from April 2nd, 1997 to December 24th, 1997. It centers around our main protagonist, Utena Tenjo, a tomboyish teenage girl who was inspired by a kind prince in her childhood to become a prince herself. She attends Otoli Academy, where she meets a student named Anthi Himemia, who is a girl in an abusive relationship with another student. Utena fights to protect Anthi and is pulled into a series of sword duels with the members of the student council. Revolutionary Girl Utena is a highly metaphysical, surreal, and allegorical sojo series. It contains a mix of visuals from the Taranazuka Theater, Shadow Puppetry, and classic Dosiai style shoujo manga. The two big themes that are present in Revolutionary Girl Utena is that of the two main characters, Utena and Anthi, being faced with misogyny and fight against by breaking the gender binary. The struggles that Utena go through center around the death of her parents when she was a little girl. Throughout the series, it's something that always lingers with her, and her driving force is to eventually find the prince that came to her aid at that time, but finds that the prince isn't who she thought he was. 
However, he sticks with him because he has a certain control over her and makes her feel wanted. The struggles that Anthe go through, without spoiling any of the main developments, is being sexually abused by her older brother, Akio. She is completely under his control and has to obey everything that he says because of things that happened to the two of them when they were young. Alone, Utena and Anthe are unable to break free of this misogyny, but together, and through the love that the two of them have for each other, they are able to break free and revolutionize the world. As for breaking the gender binary, that's what Utena's character is all about. She's a girl who wants to become a prince in order to rescue the princess. Instead of wearing the female school uniform, or even the male school uniform, she has her own version, one that is sort of a mixture of both masculine and feminine expression. She excels at basketball, often beating all of the boys in class. And she is adored by all of the girls in the school, especially by her best friend Wakaba, who often calls Utena her prince. Again, Utena's whole character embodies this anime's theme of breaking against the gender binary. Now, as for the symbolism in Revolutionary Girl Utena, there's a lot, like, oh god, a hell of a lot. Out of Ikohana's main three shows, this is the show with the most abundant amount of symbolism. Featuring some that are just impossible to interpret, stuff like Miki's stopwatch or the meaning of some of the Shadow Girl performances. But for the most part, with a lot of rewatching, research, and coming up with different theories, you can make sense of most of the symbolism. Each of the duels feature different symbolism of what the challenger is currently going through in the episode, the song often being about what the overall theme of the season is. There are also small things, like in the second season where the duel arena is filled with deaths that have a small item on them that relates to the challenger. Each set of duels are different for each season as well. The first season's duel are against the members of the student council. The second season duels are against people who are connected to the members of the student council. The third season duels are against the members of the student councils again with their companions in order to close out their individual character arcs. And my favorite case of symbolism because of Ikuhara's weird obsession with them, how Akio's car in the third season is symbolic of sex. That gets funnier every time I say it. The other frequent use of symbolism is during the Shadow Girls performances. Every episode, there is a one to two minute scene of the Shadow Girls performing a little skit for the audience. These are usually comical little scenes that often tie into the overall story of the episode. Their appearances get even better when you realize that the three Shadow Girls are actually students at the school and are part of the drama club. It adds a whole new dimension to them that really makes me love them. Style is also a big thing in Revolutionary Girl Utena. Because the group that created the anime was a newly formed group, they didn't have a really great budget. That makes the anime look poor at times, and for it to feature a crap ton of repetition. But in my opinion, it's fun and enjoyable repetition that gives each episode a nice flowing pace and format. Also through Ikuhara's clever and creative directing, the anime comes across as very stylized. The animation isn't great, but the style is. There are lots of good shots and the cinematography is amazing as well. Revolutionary Girl Utena is a textbook way of using style to overshower the fact that you barely have any budget to speak of. Now onto the lesbian stuff. As I mentioned before, Utena and Anthe develop a relationship with each other and help each other break free from their individual abusive relationships. These are two bisexual women who are there for each other though their lies and betrayals to each other at times make them complex as well. Now, if you watch the show, you may realize that the two characters never kiss, despite the constant teasing of it, actually being a joke in one of the Shadow Girls' skits. This is actually because when Ikuhara tried to put very explicit moments of romance between Utena and Anthe, like kissing, the producers who backed the show wouldn't allow it. It was the 90s and that shit was very controversial in Japan. <laughs> Hell, it still is now. Frustrated at not having full creative control, Ikuhara put in as much subtext in the characters' movements and dialogue that he could get away with. And the Shadow Girls skit that I mentioned before, it was Ikuhara acknowledging and making fun of the producers for not allowing him to have the two female characters kiss on screen. I've talked about Utena and Anthe enough in this section before, but there's another lesbian character to talk about. Juri, my favorite character. Now anyone who watches her first centric episode nowadays can see the fact that she is a lesbian a mile away. But in Japan back in the 90s, the fact that it was Shiori in her locket instead of a boy was a big surprise to everyone. The episode is well executed enough that even though it is predictable nowadays, it is still really enjoyable. The overall character arc is easily the strongest of all the characters in the show. Her journey is out of unrequited love and trying to move past it. It is easily the best part of Revolutionary Girl Utena. Still in this section, let's shift to the anime's companion movie, Adolescence of Utena, a sort of retelling of the anime, the main difference being the two. 
is that Ikuhara got full control over the movie, no producers to get in the way of his creative freedom. This was good for a number of reasons. For one, we got to see a more masculine Utena, from her more apparent male attire to her flirting with other girls like Wakaba and even her shorter hair. This is an Utena who is more confident and aware of her masculine expression and bisexuality. Most importantly of all, the love between Utena and Anthi here is much more explicit, actually allowing the two girls to kiss, Ikuhara finally achieving what he wanted from the beginning. The only negative that I would say about Ikuhara getting full control of the movie is that sometimes his mind is fucking crazy. For example, Ikuhara seems to have a weird obsession with cars and other motor vehicles. Evidence of this is the car symbolic of sex thing that I mentioned before. But he's also implemented cars and other stuff like some of the daemons and even one of the Witches 5's cars in the third season of Sailor Moon. But that isn't even the tip of the iceberg, where in the Utena movie, an hour in, out of fucking nowhere, Utena suddenly transforms into a car. All so that she can become the vehicle to help Anthe escape from the patriarchal world. I'm not shitting you. This actually happens. And it is both the stupidest and most amazing thing I've ever seen. Who the fuck are you, Ikuhara? Next up is Ikuhara's second anime, Penguin Drum, which came out from July 8th, 2011 to December 23rd, 2011. The anime is about a terminally ill girl named Himari who is miraculously saved from death by a strange spirit who resides in a penguin-shaped hat. However, in exchange for extending her life, the spirit tasks Himuri's brothers, Kamba and Soma, to seek out an elusive item known as the Penguin Drum with the assistance from a trio of strange penguins. If you saw the review I did of the anime a little while ago, then you'll know that I don't like this anime that much. I didn't like the characters, thought that there were too many problematic aspects about it, and I just found it boring by the end. But I also stated that I liked the style of the anime and the way that it was directed, as I am a huge fan of Kunihiku Igohara. Now how about those themes? Well, the biggest theme that is apparent is that our characters being affected by the sins of their parents. In some characters' cases, it's what their parents did to the world that affects the children now. Others is what the parents did to the children themselves that made them what they are now. The things that these characters need to accomplish in order to get better is to forget about the past and just become their own person, and to not be at the mercy of destiny, and that you can change it if your drive is hard enough. Family is also a big theme in Penguin Drum, as what everything that the three main characters do is for each other. For better and, well, for worse. And then at the end of the anime, different families are formed where the characters can live together happily forever. The other big theme in the anime is how the events in Penguin Drum somewhat mirror events of the Tokyo Subway Seiren attack of 1995. In the anime, the parents of Kamba, Soma, and Himari were a part of a religious group that placed a ton of bombs in the subway trains, resulting in the deaths and injury of many. The real-life incident was an act of domestic terrorism perpetrated by members of a cult movement. They did this by releasing sarin on three lines of Tokyo subway during rush hour, killing 12, injuring 50, and causing temporary vision problems for nearly 5,000 others. And when you discover this in the anime and are able to connect it to the real-life tragedy, the anime takes on a whole new meaning. Despite the crazy and fantastical elements in the show, it takes on a whole sense of realism with this event and treats it well. The symbolism in Penguin Drum is much easier to decipher than in Revolutionary Girl Utena. One example is the three adorable little penguins that follow the three siblings along, with the other one following Masako around. They perform little actions off to the side as our main characters discuss things. The things that they do often shadow what is happening in this scene. The three penguins' actions and personality is also similar to that of the one that they accompany. The penguin who follows Kamba likes dirty magazines and looking at girls. The one who follows Soma is always helping others and eating. The penguin who follows Himari always does some knitting and takes care of the other two penguins. Masako's penguin often tries to get with Kamba's penguin, which mirrors Masako and Kamba. The other moments of symbolism has to do with the trains. In every episode, the characters take the train to get to their destinations and often have very important conversations in them. This is used to mirror the real-life tragedy and always makes us aware of it. In some serious scenes, the number 95 will be flashed everywhere. For a while, I couldn't understand what it meant. But I eventually came to realize that the 95 was related to the year that the real-life tragedy took place. 1995. That blew my fucking mind. Another symbolic thing related to the trains is that in the show, there is a popular dual idol group. They have advertisements in the trains that are different every episode. It is often a life lesson that they teach the passengers in order to be a better citizen. 
However, these lessons often mirror what the characters are going through in the current episode, or what they are about to do. Now, of course, Ikuhata's style is all over the place in this anime. Like saving money in different spots, but still being visually stylized, like background characters walking around looking like male and female symbols on signs. Repetition is also key here too, transition scenes often being the same. However, the cool thing about this style is how it connects to the symbolism and themes of Penguin Drum. While all of these elements seem super confusing at the beginning separately, by the end it all comes together and you see how it all fits into the bigger picture. One example is the real life tragedy that I talked about before. Another has to do with those two idols. While at first they appear to just be a side thing, we learn in a flashback episode that in elementary school, they were actually friends of Himari, and the three of them were supposed to be a trio idol group. However, certain events caused them to drift apart and separate. With this knowledge, Himari's character becomes totally different. The way the three elements of theme, symbolism, and style connect together is done perfectly. And now, on to the lesbian stuff in Penguin Drum and how it is not good at all. The only gay character in this anime is Yuri, and yes, that name is on purpose. She is a part of the show's version of the Taranazuka Revenue. If you want to know what that is, stay tuned for my video next week. She's a celebrity and everyone thinks that she is beautiful. However, Yuri self-loathes herself and her appearance because of what her father did to her when she was young. At a young age, she befriended Momoka, who made her happy again. This is when Yuri fell in love with Momoka. Unfortunately, Momoka died in the terrorist attack and left Yuri alone. 17 years later, Yuri befriends Momoka's younger sister Ringo, who was born on the same day that Momoka died. So in the middle of the show, Yuri drugs Rinko in order to rape her to turn her into Momoko. How the fuck does that work? Who knows? Is this an extremely negative representation? Hell yes! I don't even understand why Ikuhara put this in his anime. Nothing like this was done to the gay characters in Revelation Shogoro Utena. Maybe it's because Yuri is a lesbian that Ikuhara just doesn't equate it with rape and that she can get away with it. I don't know, that's the only reason that I can come up with. In the end though, Yuri falls into the predatory lesbian trope and the worst part of it is that this scene is never addressed again after this and everyone just forgets about it. Are you fucking kidding me? So for that reason and more, I don't think that Penguin Drum is Ikuhara's best work by a fucking mile. But at least his style and directing was still excellent. <sighs> Whatever. Let's just move on. Ikuhara's last project as of right now is Yurikuma Arashi, which came out from January 5th, 2015 to March 30th, 2015. The anime takes place in a world where humans have created a wall of severance to separate themselves from the bears. These bears had previously grew violent and attacked humans after a far-off planet known as Kumaria exploded, turning into a meteor shower that fell upon Earth. Two bears, Ginko Yurishiro and Lulu Yurigazaki, sneak through the Wall of Severus and disguise themselves as humans. They enroll in a special academy and take an interest in a girl named Kurea Tsubaki, a human girl who despises bears. Now the themes that Yurikuma Arashi presents is that of Japan's societal views towards lesbianism in both its media and in real life. And somehow all relating to bears. How you may ask? Well, Ikuhara has commented on how bears in media are often portrayed as cute and cuddly creatures, but then in real life, people treat bears as big and ferocious creatures. As you may or may not know, lesbian media is all over Japan. From anime to manga to advertisements, lesbians are shown as cute girls who show beautiful romantic love with each other. But in real life Japan, people are very homophobic towards gay people, including lesbians, and it's not something that you reveal about yourself if you are one. In the anime, all of the disguised bears have the word Yuri in them, and they all end up being gay. Meanwhile, on the human girl side, there is that of the invisible storm. The human girls join together to create this in order to protect themselves from the bears. And if any human girl starts to become visible, discovering their sexuality, they are excluded. The invisible girls always try to find someone to band together and exclude, this person usually being someone who is friendly with the bears. This relates to Japan's exclusion of real-life lesbian people or people that might be closely related to them. Though lots of the invisible girls are hypocrites because some engage in sexual relationships in secret or some have very strong friendships with other girls. But not a step further or they would become visible and be excluded. This is also a play on Japan's Class S, which is a thing in Japan where girls in middle school and high school are encouraged to form close bonds and become close friends. These girls often hold hands, cuddle, and go on dates. They also often profess their love for each other, but are not allowed to go any further. This is to prepare the girl for when she's older and will eventually date and marry a man. They are also expected to leave the close bond that they formed with their female friend as they are a wife now. 
if they refuse to leave this bond, then they are labeled as childish and immature. These are strong themes for the anime to have, and I love the way that Ikuhara crafts it into the anime. It's a theme about a subject that no one has really tackled before, and it puts all the lesbian anime and characters that I love so much in a different perspective. It also brings attention to the hypocrisy between Japan's use of homosexuality in its media as opposed to how they treat it in real life. Now onto the symbolism of Yurikuma Arashi. I already talked about the Invisible Storm before, and that's definitely the big one, but there are still some others. Like the Wall of Severance that separates the humans from the bears. This one, like the number 95 from Penguin Drum, took me a while to figure out. But then I decided to look up what the word Severus even means. I discovered that it means, quote, the action of ending a connection or relationship, end quote. Which made me theorize that the Wall of Severance means the adults putting an end to the two female friends' close bond with each other in order to prepare them for marriage and adulthood, and that the wall in the anime is to separate the invisible human girls from discovering their sexuality and befriending the bears. The only way that the bears can disguise themselves to join human girls is to cross this wall of severance. Another big and obvious symbolism is the Yuri Trials. Obviously, the act of the bears eating the humans who are visible is an allegory to the term of lesbians eating each other out. Eating pussy, you might say. So sometimes, especially in the first three episodes, Ginko and Lulu attend the trial to persuade the life judgment guys to allow them to eat Kureha. This allowing Kureha to defeat the bear that is trying to kill her that episode. After Life Sexy approves the Yuri, we see Kureha naked with Ginko and Lulu licking honey off of a lily flower. What is the word for lily in Japanese? Yuri. That's right, it's all an allegory for eating that puss. I apologize. A small case of symbolism is that of Lulu's bee friend that we see in the fourth episode, which is her backstory episode. The bee circles Lulu again and again and attacks the life judgment guys when they try to get too close to her in order to woo her. Also when Lulu comes to love her little brother that she had previously hated before, the bee starts to circle him as well. Later when Lulu meets Ginko for the first time where she gives her back her little brother's honey, the bee circles Ginko as well. This tells me that Lulu's bee friend circling her represents her personal space and those that she allows to get close to her. This way the bee now protects both her and the people that she cares about. The style presented here in Yurikuma Arashi is more similar to Revolutionary Go Utena than Penguin Drum. Except unlike Utena, Yurikuma Arashi had a really good budget. Which means that both the animation looks great and the anime is visually stylized. The winding circling staircase returns from Utena, as well as the transformation sequence from both Utena and Penguin Drum. Also just like Utena, there is a lot of repetition in many of the anime sequences, though this really winds down towards the middle of the anime. In my opinion, the theme, symbolism, and style in this is Ikohara at his best. He used the best aspects of Utena and went away with the worst aspects of Penguin Drum to create what is, in my opinion, a masterpiece. Now onto the lesbian stuff in Yurikuma Arashi, and boy is there a lot of them. I mean, the word Yuri is in the title, so there's that. Almost every single goddamn character in this show, except for the Life Judgment guys, are a lesbian in some way. Everyone. What do you mean everyone? EVERYONE! All the bears that disguise themselves as human are lesbians. Main character Kuleha is a lesbian, and even some of the invisible girls are lesbians in secret. And unlike Revolutionary Girl Utena, where the producers didn't allow Ikuhara to show any explicit gay stuff, in Yurikuma Arashi, it is all here, baby. Including an honest-to-god kiss in the last episode. Enjoy here, folks, because this shit is rare in anime. Lesbianism is what this entire show is about, from the themes to the characters to even the driving force of the ending is all about gay women love. Uh, spoilers for the ending of Yurikuma Arashi and a little bit of Utena to follow. In Utena, it was Utena's love for Anthi and sacrificing herself that allowed Anthi to finally leave her brother and escape the world of the Academy. In Yurikuma Arashi, Kureha decides to transform into a bear to be with Ginko and they ascend into the heavens with Kumaria. Yoko Ai, witnessing it, becomes inspired and later decides to leave the Invisible Storm where she finds an abandoned and crying Komaya Yurikawa at the Gate of the Wall of Severance. She confronts the bear and the two embrace. By not being afraid and showing their love, Ginko and Kureha have created a domino effect of human girls deciding to no longer be invisible and embrace their sexuality. And for those that aren't lesbians, embrace those who are. As a lesbian myself, I freaking love Yurikuma Arashi. But as for my absolute favorite, 
I would go to Revolutionary Girl Utena for a multitude of reasons. Though, that's best said for uh, another video. In the end, Ikuhara is my favorite anime director for a number of reasons. I love his themes, his use of symbolism, and his insane and crazy style. And I just love how he embraces the Yuri genre and makes it his own. Sure, he had a major misstep with Penguin Jump, but even then, his directing of theme, symbolism, and style were excellent. Revolutionary Girl Utena and Yuri Kama Arashi are two of my favorite anime. Kunihiko Ikuhara is a cis straight man in a country that really rejects homosexuality in their real world that created two out of three amazing queer pieces. Here's hoping that with his new anime next year, it'll be just as amazing and full of queer elements as those two.